for those of you that don't know me, I am Jen Donovan. I am a licensed professional counselor. I am a uh, attention and trauma releasing exercises provider. Um, and I uh, spent the beginning part of my career as a mental health therapist. And then I had a major health crisis where I ended up being diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome. I had really brutal histamine intolerance as well as all of the other lovely things that tend to be comorbid with, with those kinds of things, right? These things tend to not come in isolation. So I had all sorts of things going on, had a symptom list a mile long. Uh, and I just had the conviction that I was going to heal, that I was going to get better. When doctors were telling me, when the people who diagnosed me told me that, you know, you're just going to have to take high doses of antihistamines and probably mass cell stabilizers your whole life. You might get better. We don't know, but you'll probably just be sick forever. Um, I just did not accept it. I just knew that it didn't make sense to me. And I didn't know really anything about health at that point. I was very much a part of the conventional Western medical model of health, you know, um, and I just knew, though, that that did not make sense to me. I knew that there was a reason my immune system was doing what it was doing, and I was determined to figure it out. So I launched into a two-year-long <laughs> epic healing journey, which, to be fair, has really just continued. Uh, once you start going down these rabbit holes, it really never ends, right? But it took me two years to get to a point where I felt like I was really significantly recovered and could really live um, what felt like a, a fairly normal life again. Um, my healing has just continued to progress since then, but it took two years to really get to a solid place in my health. There were a lot of ups and downs. I was figuring things out on my own. I was very lucky that I found some key mentors along the way that pointed me in the directions that ended up uh, really allowing me to make the kind of full recovery that I have. Um, but I still had a lot to just figure out <laughs> on my own. Uh, so there's a lot of starting and stopping and starting over and adjusting and, you know, figuring things out along the way. Um, but once I recovered, I just could not go back to my career the way it was before. I like, I knew too much <laughs> at that point, you know? And I was like, okay, I can't just go back to doing the work I did before. So I ended up going back to school. Um, I became a nu nutritional therapy practitioner as well as a gut and psychology syndrome practitioner. Um, and so added uh, a lot more um, just kind of nutritional and holistic health knowledge um, under my belt and started working full time with clients who uh, have struggled in similar ways that I have. I think because I have been through the mast cell activation and the histamine intolerance, I have gone through all the healing. I have come out the other side. A lot of people relate to me. And so I tend to attract people with those similar issues. Um, and uh, there is a lot of misinformation out there around what it actually takes to recover from these conditions or if recovery is even possible. There are not a lot of success stories out there and a lot of practitioners are a little bit flabbergasted about how to approach these issues because we are people who are highly sensitive. And so a lot of the conventional approaches of like pounding bone broth and taking 50 different supplements and <laughs> the things that people tend to do, you know, when you go to a holistic practitioner, just like do not work. Uh, people just uh, tend to really get burned out very quickly and sometimes even get worse uh, when they start using kind of the, the general holistic uh, models. So um, you have to really approach things a different way. So I want to give you guys a little window into my approach on how I do the nutrition and gut rebuilding uh, to reverse these kinds of issues, um, what it takes and why. Um, I do actually have six full support protocols that I use. I use a very like mind body method when it comes to these kinds of issues, but nutrition is a huge part of it. So I wanted to at least give people a window in the into the nutritional approach I use and why I use it and why it's effective. Um, I will be following up after the webinar is over. Uh, 
Uh, if, uh, if you want to get started with more in-depth information about how we take a more mind-body approach to this recovery, I do have my Rebuild Your Histamine Response Masterclass course, um, which you can also join to get a lot more detail on all the protocols that I use. Um, but this is just going to give you kind of a quick start guide into the nutrition, nutritional aspects of it. So I'm going to go through the lecture. We've got a pretty big group. Um, so uh, if you could hold your questions until the end, I'm just going to go through a, a bit of a lecture and share some of this information. And then if you have questions, please put it into the chat and I will try to spend some time at the end getting to people's questions. Okay. Alrighty. So Okay, so why is nutrition so important when we are working to reverse histamine issues, mast cell activation, chemical sensitivities, food intolerances, chronic allergies, all of these things that are really just the same issue on a spectrum of severity, right? These all come down to the same root issues. They're just sometimes manifesting in slightly different ways or different levels of severity. Why is nutrition so important with this? Well, the reality is we don't really eat the food that we eat. The bacteria in our gut eat the food that we eat, right? So everything we eat is going to influence the populations of bacteria that live in our gut. And there is a massive amount of bacteria that lives in our gut. Uh, it is like the, the modest estimates are that they outnumber us two to one. <laughs> and that's a modest estimate. Some people say it's actually 10 to one, you know, so you'll see different numbers when you start looking at the research on this stuff. Um, I think there is normal variation among human populations on these numbers. And that's part of the reason you, you see different amounts. Uh, but the reality is they outnumber us. Like we are mostly bacteria and the bacteria the bacterial populations in our gut are really the foundation of our immune system. So we have this digestive tract, we have ideally this really lovely, healthy gut lining, and this gut lining has these villi, right? They have these um, kind of fingerlings that come out uh, on the digestive tract. And functionally, what this does is that it allows us to absorb a lot more nutrients because that's a huge amount of surface area than just like a flat surface, right? If we have all these protrusions coming out, we can absorb a lot more nutrients, just a lot more surface area. But then also between these fingerlings, there's these little areas, right? And um, this is kind of like our soil. Like if we think of our microbiome, if we think of all the bacterial populations as kind of like a forest, right? Um, this little area in between these villi are kind of like the soil. So it's just like layers of microbes in here and we can have a healthy soil or we can have an unhealthy soil, right? Just like in a natural environment, there is soil that is really depleted or really imbalanced, like overtaken with fungus or parasites or things like that. Um, or we can have like a really healthy balanced soil. Now, this is basically our immune system. These bacterial populations, this soil that live in between these fingerlings and the gut lining, um, this is our immune system, at least about 70% of it, right? So the immune system is complex. It manifests in a lot of different areas in the body and a lot of different capacities, but about 70% of it is um, in, these, uh, in these little areas here, in the lining of our gut, in the bacterial populations that live in our gut. So we have to understand that our bacterial populations are the foundation of our immune system. And honestly, it's not so much about exactly what strains of bacteria are in there. This is actually much more complicated. And this is why I don't give a lot of credence to like GI maps, you know, all these different stool tests that people tend to do to like see if they have gut dysbiosis or not. I honestly really never order those kinds of things for my clients because if you have any of these symptoms, we know your immune system is imbalanced, right? Like you wouldn't be having these symptoms if your immune system was not imbalanced. So when you have an imbalanced immune system, it means you have imbalance in the bacterial populations in your gut. We don't need a test to tell us that. And honestly, 
even if you are testing for certain strains of bacteria that we tend to think of as like pathogenic, you know, it doesn't actually mean that we need to douse you with antimicrobials, which is usually the first line of defense that people do, right? We are just getting a snapshot when we take those tests, right? It doesn't actually tell us a lot about the entire populations that live all through the digestive tract. It's just what happened to come out in your stool that day. And there are bacteria that might be considered pathogenic in some contexts, but if they are in the correct ratios with other bacteria, they don't cause us problems, right? So these tests can just be very misleading our microbiome is way more complicated than that, right? It's just like you can't just do a cursory survey of an entire forest and think that you know everything about all the species that live in there, right? There's a lot more depth to it. So I usually don't really bother with those things. Um, but if you are having symptoms, you know, of these chronic allergies and of these, um, you know, excessively degranulating mast cells and of these high levels of histamines and of these chemical sensitivities, we know something is going on in your immune system and we know that the populations of bacteria must be imbalanced in there. Um, and so in order to get your immune system back into balance, we have to get those microbes back into balance. Now, when we do have imbalance in the bacteria populations, there are certain strains of bacteria that do tend to overgrow. And some of them can be truly pathogenic and like make us really acutely sick, but that's actually more rare. Most of the time they are strains that in small amounts are totally fine in your body, but in large amounts can start to cause the symptoms of chronic illness. And this is because these bacteria are opportunists. <laughs> meaning if they see an opportunity, they will take it and they will start acting very selfish and they will overgrow if there's nothing else keeping it in check, right? So again, I'm going to do that metaphor of the forest. If, um, you know, something comes in, like say there's some kind of human intervention or there's some kind of, um, you know, like, um, you know, a drought, like something happens and you see like certain species start to die out, well, now other species are going to take that opportunity and overgrow, and you, it's kind of like when an invasive species might come in, this might happen too, right? And now the whole ecosystem is messed up, right? Because everything that was in this lovely, harmonious balance living together, now certain things are not being kept in check in the same way, so certain things start to overgrow, and that creates this just cascade effect where now the ecosystem starts to collapse, right? So we can think of the same thing happening in our gut. If things are not properly in balance and these opportunistic bacteria are not kept in check, they will take the opportunity, they will start to overgrow and it'll just start this cascade reaction where now the whole ecosystem inside our bodies is imbalanced. These opportunistic bacteria, they start to produce toxins as a part of their life cycle, right? Um, they tend to have these waste products that can actually be very poisonous to our bodies. Now, the good news is, we do have detox pathways, right? We have livers, we have kidneys, we have lymphatic system. So we can deal with toxins, right? But if we are having this massive source of toxicity from inside our own body, from overgrown species of bacteria, now our detox pathways get kind of congested, right? And we start to have these symptoms of uh, like, now people are concerned that like their detox pathways aren't working efficiently, right? I mean, this is a really popular thing people are talking about in the functional medicine world, like, oh, my detox pathways are congested, right? Well, why? I mean, part of that is because of bacterial overgrowth in the gut. So it's not always about things we're being exposed to in our environment, although that can contribute too, but a lot of it is actually coming from inside our own body. Now, these toxins also can dock onto receptors in our nervous system. And we have to remember that our nervous system, a huge amount of it is actually intertwined in our gut lining. It's called the enteric nervous system. And these toxins will dock onto receptors in the enteric nervous system and send stressful messages up into our brain. And so this is a huge contributor to mental health issues, 
to neurological issues. And this is why often you see co-occurrence of mast cell issues, histamine issues with mental health issues, with things like dysautonomia or neuropathy or these other kinds of neurological issues. Again, the foundation are these bacterial populations. So whether we're talking about immune function or the efficiency of our detox pathways or the regulation of our nervous system, we have to get down to the foundation of getting these bacterial populations in balance. So I really wanna emphasize that because that is the core foundation of the protocol that I find to be most effective for reversing these issues once and for all with people because it focuses on getting those bacterial populations rebalanced. Now. A lot of times people, these issues have a lot more going on than just that, right? There may be heavy metal toxicity. There may be parasitic infection. There may be candida. There may be a chronic virus, right? There are so many things that could also be going on, but none of that is going to be addressed until we rebalance the bacteria. And what I see happen most often is if we get those bacterial populations rebalanced, the immune system can kind of take care of the rest on its own. Once in a while, I will target things with people who have some stubborn symptoms, but majority of the time, once that immune system gets rebalanced because of those bacterial populations, once the nervous system starts to regulate because of those bacterial populations rebalanced, once we clear out those detox pathways because we have those bacterial populations rebalanced, once that happens, the body just kind of takes the initiative and does the work. So I don't ever jump to chasing down all these different diagnoses and, you know, different indications that people have. Yes, of course, those are contributors, but let's start with this foundation first. And I find this is the most effective way to approach it. So what does this protocol consist of? First of all, it is low histamine. And I'm sure many of the people here are already on a low histamine diet. It has gained a lot of popularity. A lot of people know what that is now, but I will just share a little bit about it just in case anyone's here who doesn't. Uh, we can actually measure levels of histamines in different foods. Histamine is a compound that is higher or lower in different whole foods. So it's a natural compound that can occur in some foods. There are also compounds in some foods that may not be histamine per se, but may be chemicals that can liberate histamines and so tend to cause people with these kinds of allergic symptoms problems. Now, none of these foods are bad. A food being high histamine or histamine liberator, that does not mean that food is bad or unhealthy. It is a totally normal compound that comes in whole foods. People have been eating these foods for a long time not actually a problem. The only problem that happens is when people's histamine levels are already so high because of all these other things going on with the imbalance in the immune system, the congested detox pathways, all of this kind of stuff, that if they intake excess histamine in their food, it makes their symptoms just completely overflow and it becomes debilitating, right? And makes you unable to actually do the things in your day-to-day -day life that are going to allow you to recover, right? So that is the only reason to do a low histamine diet is to reduce your symptoms. A low histamine diet does not heal or reverse the underlying cause. It reduces symptoms, but sometimes that is necessary. You know, I was completely debilitated by my symptoms and a lot of the clients that come to me are as well. And so we do need to take your general ability level into consideration if you're going to be successful, right? So I do keep my protocol low histamine in the beginning because we do want to reduce symptoms as much as possible. This protocol is based on the specific carbohydrate diet. So this is a diet that was actually developed in the early 1900s to treat celiac disease because celiacs used to be considered complex carbohydrate intolerance. It wasn't until the 50s when gluten was discovered that they changed the definition of celiac disease to be gluten intolerance. Originally, they knew that this was actually complex carbohydrate intolerance, right? Meaning that any starch, any complex carbohydrate was going to trigger symptoms in people. And unfortunately, we've forgotten that knowledge for the most part, although I think that some people are figuring this out now. 
But what happened was that uh, this physician developed this diet that took all starch out of the diet. And he found that it started reversing people's celiac disease, Crohn's disease, colitis, all these severe digestive disorders, right? And at first he didn't know why, you know, but later as people did research in the 60s and 70s, and then Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who developed the GAPS diet, really started picking this up more in the 80s and 90s when she was doing her own research into microbiology and nutrition, um, that the reason that this works is that over, um, sorry, opportunistic bacteria that overgrows that I've been talking about, feeds on undigested starch that we eat. And when we have a compromised digestive system, we do not completely digest the complex carbohydrates and the opportunistic bacteria in our gut has a complete field day <laughs> and it just fuels them, right? And so the idea with the specific carbohydrate diet is, well, okay, if we pull out all the starch from the diet, now we are no longer feeding those overgrown bacteria those populations can start to starve out and they can return back to their more balanced levels. So that is a theory behind the specific carbohydrate diet that has been adapted for the GAPS protocol. And I use those principles myself in the protocols that I use for my clients because I find that it is wildly effective. Again, because we have to look at the balance of those bacterial populations as the foundation of the issue. So the protocol is also starch free. Now, I also take out certain plant compounds that I find to be irritating when we are trying to heal the gut. So remember I was talking about all those like fingerlings in the gut lining, right? When you have overgrown bacteria, it causes a lot of inflammation and irritation in the lining of the gut, right? And what happens is as the gut lining becomes more damaged and more inflamed, these little fingerlings, these little villi, they start to get really decrepit, right? They start to break down and then the, molly, um, sorry, the cells in the lining of the gut start to pull apart, right? And that's what causes leaky gut, right? So it's basically like tears, like inflamed tears in the gut lining, right? So there are compounds in a lot of plants that are inherently irritating, right? They're anti-nutrient compounds. If you have a healthy, intact gut, they shouldn't be a problem, right? I'm specifically talking about things like lectins and things like oxalates. Those are the two ones that I find cause the most problems for people when they're trying to heal their gut. Again, these are compounds that we have been eating in foods for thousands of years. There's no reason to be afraid of these compounds. There's a lot of fear mongering out there about these compounds. They are not inherently dangerous. They are just dangerous for some people who already have damage in their gut, right? Because what happens is if your gut is already inflamed and your gut is already leaky and wounded, basically, think about when you like scratch your arm and your skin is healthy, like it's fine, right? No problem. It doesn't even really hurt. But if you had a big wound on your arm and you scratched it, that would be incredibly painful and it would really stop that wound from healing, right? So you can think about this in the same way with your gut lining. If you already have damage and inflammation in your gut lining and you're eating all these high lectin, high oxalate foods, which are sharp and irritating in nature, you are just kind of digging into the wound that is already there. And these can make an obstacle for gut repair. Um, unfortunately, a lot of high lectin and high oxalate foods are also low histamine. And so I see a lot of people coming to me that are eating these low histamine diets that are very high in lectins and very high in oxalates. And they're like, well, yeah, my symptoms have reduced a little bit, but like, you know, you reach this plateau where it's like, I'm just not healing anymore. And I find that if we take those out, suddenly the healing starts progressing again, because you're actually giving your gut lining a break from these irritating compounds and it can actually start to repair itself. And most of the time people can bring these back in later and tolerate them much better. So that is the parameter of uh, my protocol. Low histamine to reduce symptoms, starch free to rebalance the bacterial populations and low lectin, low oxalate to promote the healing of the gut lining. The idea is if we do these three things, if we eliminate these three things, then you can actually get a jump start 
on the repair, healing, and rebalancing process. And in the long term, you reverse the underlying um, causes of the disease process so that you can actually expand your diet in the long term, reverse allergies in the long term, reverse food intolerances in the long term, so that you don't have to be on a restricted diet forever. So that you don't have to walk on eggshells around your body forever, right? That is the goal. If you are on a symptom reducing diet, you're gonna be on that forever. A truly medicinal diet is going to be more restrictive than a symptom reducing diet, but it's going to be strategically restrictive in that you are allowing for the deeper healing to unfold more efficiently so that you can expand more in the long term. So that is why my protocol is structured the way that it is. Okay. Let me show you all a couple things. So everyone here today is going to get access to um, my mini course that I'm going to be launching. I'm going to be selling a mini course called Reaction Free um, about uh, this protocol. Uh, but everyone who's here today will get into it for free for coming to the webinar. And so you will get access to all these lists and everything. So um, don't worry about like trying to screenshot or <laughs> whatever, you will get access to them. Um, but I want to go over a couple of parameters. For uh, low histamine, these are, I mean, you can also like do your own research on some of these things as well. Um, but for low histamine, a lot of times uh, we are actually taking out things that people will do for gut healing, <laughs> right? But the idea is, is that we bring back these things later once you're uh, histamine intolerance has reversed. So we can start to get a jump start on the gut repair. We can start to get a jump start on rebalancing the bacterial populations without doing some of these very high histamine traditionally gut healing foods so that you can build your tolerance for histamines and foods. And those are the first additions of what we reintroduce. So things like bone broth, things like fermented foods. <laughs> are the primary things, right? That people who are trying to do gut healing will do and just wreak havoc on your body when you have histamine issues. These are great for healing the gut. They totally are, but not when they make your symptoms go out of control, right? So we don't do bone broth. We don't do ferments. We keep it within low histamine parameters. Once your symptoms have stabilized, you can start to bring those in. But I always start bringing in meat stock because this is much, much gentler on the gut. It's much lower in histamine and it's much lower in glutamate, which are the compounds in bone broth that people tend to react to. So this is short cooked. So I have instructions on how to do this in the mini course, but this is the first thing you will introduce that is higher histamine. Once you feel like your symptoms have stabilized, you start bringing in the meat stock, I have instructions on how to introduce things as well. Literally like a spoonful at a time. It's okay to go slow. There's no rush. And this is a thing that people with histamine issues tend to do is they tend to say like, okay, I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to drink like three cups of this thing that I'm going to try. <laughs> slow and steady is much better than doing a ton of something and crashing and burning. And so when we bring things in, spoonful at a time before you know it, you're drinking a whole cup, right? And you haven't overloaded yourself. You haven't crashed and burned. You actually probably will get to that higher amount more sustainably faster by introducing things slowly and intentionally. The next thing I have people introduce are ferments. Wild, right? Introducing ferments, people with histamine intolerance, a teaspoon at a time. <laughs> right? This is how you start. You do not go and eat a big bowl of kefir or sauerkraut, <laughs> right? A teaspoon at a time and you home make it so that you don't have any, um, you have consistent parameters, right? If you're buying store-bought stuff, 
you don't know how long they fermented it, right? And so it's going to be a little more chaotic to try to introduce a ferment. If you're home making it, you know exactly how long you fermented it, right? And so you can be really consistent with your introductions. Introducing fermented foods is the key to long-term gut health, but you do not have to be eating bowls of kefir or bowls of sauerkraut. You can be doing a teaspoon at a time and get incredible benefits. And usually once people are on this protocol for a period of time, they are surprised how well they tolerate ferments, how quickly. It really is amazing. So that is kind of what I spend people's histamine points on <laughs> as people start to recover, because these are going to be the most therapeutic things to add. I do have a guide on things to add next, but basically once you get to a point where you feel you have fully reversed your histamine intolerance and you're not having like mast cell flares with high histamine foods, you're not having mast cell flares with um, like environmental exposure to things, you know, then you're in remission, right? And that, and only that is when you bring in starch again. So you do not bring starch again until you feel like you are solidly in remission. Now by in remission, I don't mean that you never have any symptom ever. We are people, we are complex. I don't want people to have an unattainable goal, but by remission, I mean 90 to 95% of the time you have no symptoms. And when you do, they are mild and tolerable, right? At that point, I call that remission. And after that, that is when you reintroduce the starchy foods because then you are feeding bacteria, right? And so we only wanna be feeding bacteria once we know our gut is back in balance, right? And that's when we are um, great, greatly reduced in our symptoms and greatly improved in our functioning. Okay, I will also say that uh, some of this is mindset <laughs> as well, right? Um, because people with these, uh, these kinds of issues, tend to be highly anxious. And that is 100% understandable because a lot of people have had really scary and debilitating reactions to things, sometimes life-threatening. It would be weird if you weren't scared, <laughs> right? At the same time, that fear can send your nervous system into a feedback loop where now you become afraid of foods, you become afraid of trying new things, you feel anxious about something, your cortisol is up, you are now more likely to react to it right? This is part of the reason I have my full six support protocols on my masterclass course, Rebuild Your Histamine Response. Two of those six protocols are about mindset and nervous system regulation because it is so important. And so if you think that is something that is really important for you, I do encourage you to get on that course. It is lifetime access that so you have plenty of time to go through everything. You just play, pay a flat fee and you have access to all the protocols for life. Um, but that could be really beneficial for people that know this is a big part of their story. But with the uh, material you are going to get, um, you will get a guide to a reaction-free mealtime method, <laughs> which is basically about learning how to get yourself grounded and regulated before you eat. Right. And I've had some really remarkable things happen with people where they actually, before even completely getting on the on the protocol, they actually reversed intolerances by just doing this reaction free mealtime method. <laughs> so sometimes it really is huge in your mind with mindset and getting your nervous system regulated. And this does not mean that it is just in your head, like you are having a physiological response. It's not in your head but it's just that our brain has a lot of power over our body and our brain has a lot of power over how our body responds to things, right? So I am including this in the mini course, even though it's focused on nutrition, I just think it's really important for people to have some practices to approach this protocol with. Okay. So real quick, I want to show a list of high starch foods, just so people have a sense of this, because a lot of times, you know, you say like starch free and people are like, I don't even know what starch is. <laughs> so these are things 
like a lot of additives in processed foods. So the first thing that we need to do is really get on a whole foods diet. If that's not a step you've taken yet, that is the first thing to do, right? So if uh, you are eating things that have a lot of preservatives in them, that have a lot of thickening agents in them, right? Um, this is uh, going to be a, a huge issue because a lot of these kinds of things are starch based, right? And a lot of this is stuff like cornstarch, which is stuff like maltodextrin and dextrose, which often come in um, processed food, uh, but also even in like so-called healthier brands, right? There's stuff like tapioca flour, right? Um, xanthan gum, like all of these thickening agents. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't uh, share my screen. Sorry if I uh, mis misphrased that. Um, the other things are going to be hidden sugar ingredients, right? So obviously if you are still eating products with refined sugars, um, you know, you want to be getting off that because this is going to feed the bacteria but also really popular natural alternatives as well. So coconut sugar, raw cane sugar, maple syrup, yes, they are more natural, right? And they're going to be less dysregulating for your blood sugar potentially for some people, um, but uh, they are still gonna cause a problem when we're trying to rebalance the microbiome. It's also going to be grains, right? So it's gonna be things like oats, rice, corn, it's going to be things like legumes, most legumes at least. So things like um, soybeans, chickpeas, uh, navy beans, brown beans, black beans, all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's going to be anything that contains lactose, right? And unfortunately all the lactose or all the dairy that is low histamine means that it has lactose because it's not very well fermented, right? So a lot of people with histamine issues can still tolerate soft cheeses, uh, but that means that they're full of lactose and are going to be feeding that bacterial overgrowth. And then it's going to be uh, starchy vegetables, right? So things like potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams, cassava, right? Very common. Tiger nut, plantain, things popular on often like AIP or um, like paleo type diets. And then some sugar alcohols, which are often used as like keto sweeteners, right? So things like xylitol, sorbitol, things like that. Things that are high oxalate are often things that people are eating a lot of on a low carbohydrate so-called healthy paleo or keto diet, but also often on whole foods, vegan diets. Um, so things like leafy greens, like spinach, kale, chard, a lot of nuts and seeds, right? Low starch, but often very high in oxalates. Also things like, um, things that are high in lectins would be things like, um, things that often are low histamine, um, and often like eaten on whole foods diets. So things like squash, cucumbers, nightshades, things like this. So these are surprising things that I have people eliminate that I see really benefit their healing process. And again, it's not because any of these foods are bad. When you have a healthy gut, you can eat these foods no problem, right? So it's not about food fear. It's just about promoting your best healing for a period of time. Okay, so what do you eat? Okay, so I am actually going to share my screen this time. Sorry if that was confusing before. And you'll get this handout. So meat is the foundation. For people who cannot tolerate meat, I only see this once in a while. Actually, most people I meet um, have much more of a problem with plants than meat. Um, but occasionally I will come across someone that is very reactive to meat. So first of all, I make sure that they are using low histamine parameters for buying and storing their meat. Um, but if they're still reacting to meat, I do have a very 
short-term vegetarian reset that it will sometimes put people through that usually allows them to start tolerating meat again. So that will be an option, but I'm not gonna talk about it a lot today. We do healthy fats, which are all low histamine. And these are the vegetables that have that Venn diagram magical combination of being low histamine, low starch, low uh, oxalate, and low lectin. So any of these are great. I do allow people to keep in fruit, especially at the beginning, because it can really help with the transition. This is a very limited therapeutic diet, and so it can be nice for people, although I usually encourage people to eliminate fruit for at least a three-month period of time at some point during their healing process. I find that this actually really helps people make more progress faster. But these are all low histamine fruits, low oxalate fruits, low lectin fruits, and low starch fruits. I do have people do fresh herbs as tolerated. Very simple, very simple, very healing. For people who have a hard time with plants at all, I use carnivore quite a bit. So carnivore is also gonna be an option if you find that you do not do well with vegetables or fruits at all, even the low lectin, low histamine, low oxalate one, which I get quite a few people like that. I get quite a few people who come who basically are like, I can tolerate chicken and cabbage and oatmeal. <laughs> and I can only tolerate the cabbage sometimes. <laughs> Someone comes to me like that, I usually just have them do carnivore. Okay, so that's a little preview. And again, this is done until your symptoms are stabilized enough that you can start introducing the higher histamine gut healing foods, the meat stock and the ferments. Once you tolerate those, you can start expanding your diet further. Okay.